Hello and welcome to another episode of Building Success, a real estate podcast. My name is Nick and I will be your guide once again as we talk to some of the best and brightest in the worlds of real estate tech, operations, and financials from across the globe. This podcast would not be possible without listeners such as yourselves, so if you like what you hear and you want to hear more of it, please think about liking or subscribing from iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere that you get this podcast. We would really appreciate it. So today on Building Success, I am excited because we will be doing the first of a series of panels that came from the International Users Conference that MRI held in Atlanta, Georgia here in October. And with me today is Andy Welkley, Product Marketing Manager at MRI Software, who was a moderator for one of these panels. How are you doing today, Andy? I'm doing great, Nick. Excited to be here. And before we dive into the recorded panel, I just wanted to talk to you about what it was that you achieved, who it was you spoke to, uh, what our listeners might get out of today's episode. Well, we had a fantastic panel. Uh, we had Melissa Barto from Measurable. We had Jeff Lewis from Honest Buildings. Scott Morey from GPG Advisors and Brian Wong from Waypoint uh, brought a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the panel uh, and had a really good dynamic interaction, which I think your listeners will really appreciate, not just the depth of their expertise, but their ability to really share their thoughts and ideas. Great. So what was it that you dove into? Yeah, we had a real timely discussion. Uh, We talked about the advent of shared space around uh, WeWork and other uh, similar asset classes, that emerging process, and how that's changing the relationship that commercial landlords have with not just their tenants, but also their tenants' tenants and what that means. Um, We also dove into a little bit of sustainability, which is a hot topic now. Um, And we kind of rolled that all together and talked about how urban settings are changing with the advent of lift and uh, scooters across and drones, um, really changing the dynamic of buildings and how people consider renovating or redeveloping buildings in an urban setting. Awesome. So I was there for some of the panel. It was really good and productive. And for you at home listening, um, this is this is live from the session. We put a microphone right at one of the seats, so it's just like you're there. You'll hear all the little little pops, noises, sounds, uh, but we really do hope you get something out of it. Uh, we plan to release a couple more of these that came from the International Users Conference. So thank you, Andy, for your time. And without further ado, let's get to the panel. Thanks, Nick. general is to meet and interact with as many of you as possible. Um, Many of the sessions engage your analytical brain. We ask you to watch demonstrations and learn more about the products and how to use them. But as part of this year's IUC, we're looking at engaging the other part of your brain, the creative, the thinking part of your brain as we look at trends in the industry, as we look at things that we're seeing change and that we think will affect your businesses going forward. Uh, So in some ways, you guys are our test cases. Uh, As we try to integrate more of this thought leadership, more of this panel discussions um, into the IUC. That being said, these are not forward-looking statements and cannot be taken in any way. Um, You've seen these slides several times. What we really do appreciate the people that come and participate with us, spend their time um, and their expertise in the Expo Center and and interact with all of you there. Um, And really, this conference wouldn't be possible without companies like these uh, who support this effort and the way that we're able to communicate with all of you. So thank you to the sponsors, um, and especially the four of you today. I think you've all been scanned. Uh, We actually have our best scanner in the room here today. Um, Emily's been doing yeoman's work, sometimes doubling up on sessions. So um, only two more sessions to get scanned. Uh, You can forget this slide forever, too. We are actually really lucky today. Um, At MRI over the past year, we spent a lot of time producing content that isn't necessarily product related either. Uh, On Wednesday, we release a video, uh, usually three to five minutes, about a different topic every week. Sometimes they're a little bit more product specific, sometimes they're really high level. Uh, We call it our Whiteboard Wednesday series. Um, Follow MRI on LinkedIn, and it's published every Wednesday. Uh, We usually try to pick a cross section from the company, whether it's from support or product management or even we let some marketing people talk once in a while. Um, But I think another interesting part is our podcast series. It's called Building Success. 
on all the podcast channels um, and outlets. And today's session is actually being recorded for a future podcast. So um, we're excited to really share all this expertise um, out there. And, and I encourage you to check out both of those resources um, as you think about your work um, and your companies. So without further ado, uh, we have four expert panelists today. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And we'll start with Scott. So my name is, can you hear me? I'm glad I was awake, by the way, so. Um, I didn't have coffee, so I was a little dodgy. But anyway, Scott Mori, I'm a partner with GPG Advisors. We're a real estate-specific uh, management consulting firm. Primarily focused kind of organizational, operational technology stuff. Probably 70% of what we do has some form of technology, but we do a lot of work that might be pure kind of organizational process, you know, strategy type stuff. So I'm based in Chicago, um, and then we have offices in New York and LA. Uh, Brian Wong, Head of Client Experience at Waypoint. Waypoint is a proud partner of MRI, um, in addition to sponsoring the conference. Um, Waypoint is a performance management software platform for asset managers and property managers in the commercial real estate industry. Um, we're located in San Francisco. Um, my specific roles overseeing our relationships to the market with our both existing and prospective clients. Hi, I'm Melissa Barto. I'm with Measurable. We're a commercial real estate platform for all property types. We help them measure, manage, and act on sustainability. Uh, my role there is I lead all things partnering. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Lewis. I'm Chief Product Officer at Honest Buildings. And Honest Buildings, we help real estate owners uh, provide software and tools to manage their construction more effectively. Um, and we've partnered really closely with MRI over the last couple of years um, and actually just announced a, a new partnership on stage yesterday. So we're really excited about that um, and excited to be here. And didn't know this was going to be on a podcast. So the, uh, <laughs> You know, Got extra, extra cogent in my uh, remarks this morning. And Jeff and I are going to be doing a dance most of the morning uh, as we pass this back and forth. <laughs> you want to just do that? Okay, sounds good. Just on the fly, I like it. Flexibility. Uh, the first topic we're going to kind of address today uh, kind of revolves around an article we saw as we were beginning to prepare this panel uh, that WeWork is now the largest leaseholder in Manhattan, surpassing J.P. Morgan with over 5.3 million square feet uh, under lease. And we're seeing this trend of shared spaces really take off. Um, and I wonder if we could start with Jeff and get your uh, kind of observations about what you're seeing and how that's impacting commercial real estate. Yeah, absolutely. So Honest Buildings, were almost 90 employees now, uh, based all in New York City. And one of the things that's been really interesting is as we've grown from, when I joined the company, there were about seven people five years ago, and now we're, now we're 90 folks. It's been, you know, there's been a lot of growth. Uh, that entire time we've been in WeWork space uh, and continue to be today. Um, Eloise, who's one of our employees, can attest that we're extremely jammed up, uh, us 90 employees in our current WeWork space. But I think we're probably in our fourth WeWork space. Uh, you know, effectively every year we've sort of moved up in office space. And I think that one of the things that's really interesting for us is we think about what new office space we're gonna go into is it's extremely difficult to sign a, a three or a five or a seven or especially a 10 year lease on office space, just given that we don't really know how big we're gonna be over the next few years and the sort of flexibility and optionality is super important for us. So I think as, you know, as, as people think about some of these high growth companies, you know, the traditional office space model of you know, 10 year lease, high credit tenant, just doesn't really work for us. And I think WeWork has, has come in and you know, I think when you think of WeWork historically, you think of these sort of small two one or two or four person office spaces, but they've actually done a ton of work to get to these 20, 40, 100 person uh, companies. And you know, most recently they announced that they're actually gonna be redoing UBS's corporate headquarters, right? And it's, it's hard to get to a company that's much bigger than UBS. So I think they've sort of started at this very small kind of micro office level with this much more flexible uh, space model, month to month uh, rental space. And now they've sort of expanded up into you know effectively the enterprise and everything in between. So I think it just creates a huge you know difference in the market. Like everything in commercial office is focused around that seven to ten year lease and, and credit worthy tenants. And when WeWork comes in, you know I, I think that has the the opportunity to really really change the way people think about office space, the way people finance office space, build office space. So I think it'll be a really interesting next few years as they continue to grow. Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about the time horizon? You know Jeff's mentioning seven to 10 year leases, maybe play a different role or maybe see different things. So what do you think about the time horizon of this uh, trend? 
and how it might change over time. Sure, well, I mean, I think you definitely are seeing it becoming more mainstream. Um, Equity Office recently rebranded as EQ, and they've partnered with Industrious, which is a WeWork competitor, um, to kind of get into this space. Um, certainly, from a time horizon perspective, it, it seems to be here to stay, not just a flash in the pan. And I think as you see more high growth companies, um, particularly in the technology space, is becoming the primary type of company that is making up tenants in commercial buildings, especially in office. Um, you're you're going to continue seeing that because, uh, to Jeff's earlier point, as a high growth tech company, you don't really have the luxury of locking yourself into a long term lease, especially when you don't really know what's on the horizon in the next couple of years, given you know, fundraising, you know, if you want to double your headcount in the next two years or even shorter. So, you know, I think it's, it's certainly something that you'll continue to see throughout the market. Scott, are you seeing maybe a, an emerging asset class here that requires a different management tool or technique uh, to approach this? Uh, I'm going to answer that in a second because I'm going to make a, a couple of comments. It's interesting though too with WeWork, I mean it's not economically viable, right? WeWork. It isn't at the moment. I mean if you look at their numbers, not saying there's not value relative to their product base. And what's interesting with Industrious actually is it's half the price point of WeWork. Of course it's a much smaller portfolio. WeWork also says their average company is a thousand employees now as their target and who they're going after within their space, which then contradicts, and let's say it's wrong, relative to what industrious and kind of what the market's doing. So I think we're at this funky kind of you know, inflection point and there's value around and things to learn in the design of the space. And then when you look at it kind of further, I think it's around what, what people are so focused on, on the tenant engagement side. What experience or services are you trying to provide as part of that? And you've got this mad dash of all these people like um, Equium or Lane there's another 15 applications out there that are targeting sort of the tenant engagement piece, which means a lot of different things. We could talk about that probably for, for the rest of the day. But what you're seeing, I think, and going with Equity Office and, um, and everyone actually, whether it was Bernado or Boston Properties or a bunch of you are here, I'm sure is, everyone's now trying to position what that means to them. And do they partner and do a JV like EOP with Industrious and create something, do their own product type, what kind of shared space they do, how do they, what kind of services they provide? Do they have common areas that people can rent or meeting areas? And so there's a lot of activity, and, and we're doing a bunch of projects um, on a couple of global, actually, that are, that are pretty sizable and sits to the geographic differences, but how do they solve that and how do they respond to that? And my fear with WeWork, going back to that announcement, is not to say there's not value in the product, but the balance sheet and the income statement are time. So either price points have to get readjusted to a better line with demand with companies like Industrious that are coming more aggressively, although much smaller, or they get recapitalized at some point that aligns better with kind of the market expectations. So it's interesting. It's part tech and it's part physical you know, dynamics and design of the space. So. Melissa, what do you think traditional property owners can learn from uh, this type of emerging trend? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I think what WeWork has done to the office space is totally reimagine what you want when you go to work. Um, so typically you would build a space that you would go to work in, you would have a cubicle, you go to your desk, you might go to the coffee room, and you go home. Uh, WeWork has designed around building a community. So you go into an office space and there's free coffee right away, there's someone that greets you at the door, there's someone that there might be a gym downstairs, there's happy hours weekly. And so really building on that community. Um, and I think that's what also we're gonna get into to a bigger discussion is reimagining the workplace as a secondary home now for your employees. You wanna spend more time there so the employer is happy because now their employee's not working just the standard, hey, eight to five, they're there in the morning because they know that's where they go get their coffee, they're having coffee discussions, they're staying later through the happy hour. Um, what can a traditional property owner learn from that? Great question. It's all around design. Everything is designed now. It's from the moment we open our iPhone uh, to the, how we open a door. Everything's design-centric now. So when you're thinking about whether you're in a multifamily, like maybe even public housing, how do you create an experience that um, feels maybe less like a housing community and more like just a general community or all your friends <coughs> are over um, and being more amenity rich in it. That's a really interesting point. We can talk a little bit about personal experience in our setting. At MRI, we're going through a complete renovation of our office. And we're losing conference rooms because we're growing. And that's not going to be a problem because they've designed a lot of shared spaces where 
people can collaborate in small groups for short periods of time or longer periods of time. And so I think, Melissa, you make a great point. Jeff, how's that playing out in your business? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I think one of the things about, you know, we work in general is that if you do look at some of the spaces they have for folks to actually do their work, like where your desks are, um, they're extremely small, right, relative to what you what your sort of typical expectation is from historical office space. Um, and so I think that, you know, maybe if I was a desk partner with you, we'd be like this close to each other, which, you know, is just a different style of working. And I think that, you know, the trade-off for being that close in sort of your, like, core physical desk space is that it allows for all these amenity spaces, whether it's the, the kitchen or the open area or extra conference rooms, things like that. And so I think that's, you know, very much in line with what you're describing, which is, you know, as people work more collaboratively together, as, you know, people stay later in the office or, you know, spend more time there, there's sort of a desire for less of just like a home base at your, you know, sort of cubicle and more of these like flex spaces that allow you to sort of, you know, build on the fly, sort of like, a, you know, collaborations with your, uh, with your colleagues. Has anyone walked into old, re anyone in Regis space? God, it's like a time capsule. You have to do it for fun. I swear to God, it's so depressing. <laughs> Like we were looking for a new space in the market and we ended up at WeWork. I'm also an industrious user. And I look at Regis space and it is the most depressing thing. This is being recorded, so this is not gonna go well for me. I've ever seen, actually. So you should just go do a tour and go, I can't believe people actually function in these environments. Like it is it's like medicinal, I guess, or something. I don't know how to word it. Uh, you bring up a good point though, I think like WeWork has branded itself so well that in, I hear in the market, like you go to a WeWork space now and you don't feel like you're your company. Mm -hmm. So you feel like you're kind of a split brand, you might have clients there. So one thing that I'm curious to listen to what WeWork is as they build up spaces for UBS and these larger companies, do they brand it also as the company? I think that's gonna be essential. Um, to some, I don't know how they're gonna do it, but they're gonna have to definitely have a bit of that mix. You know, we're talking about how tenants are engaging their employees or companies are engaging their employees in these spaces. Scott touched on uh, the tenant engagement piece. Brian, what are you seeing in terms of how tenants' expectations of their landlords are changing? Yeah, well, I think, you know, everybody's talking about the millennial workforce these days and, and how those expectations are changing. Um, and, you know, certainly I think that a lot of that has to do with just that generation's attitudes towards their work and, and you know, what they view as work being very core to their personal beliefs. Um, specifically as it relates to the environment, um, certainly want to work in buildings that are sustainable from an environmental standpoint, you know, have all the certifications, first and foremost. That's almost become the price of vision now for having a class A office building is making sure you're LEED certified, making sure your energy star certified. But then on top of that, what can you also provide from a services standpoint? So we have clients that have started investing in luxury attache services for their lobbies, you know really investing in, you know, the chic furniture that looks like, you know, the, the Hyatt lobby here uh, in their lobby just to, to create that experience because, you know, at least what we hear from our clients is, you know, you're, you're a tenant the moment you step out your door to, get, to head to work and, and you're not, you're not, you don't stop being a tenant until you basically go back to your house, right? So, so how can we create that experience as landlords, you know, moving forward, especially for our tenants, create that, you know, holistic experience end to end. Um, throughout their day because that is kind of shifting and mirroring what, what that workforce is starting to perceive as as their values um, instilled in their workplace. And Jeff, as you start to think about working with a tenant, working with somebody, thinking about reconfiguring their space or reacting to some of these things, what are some of the conversations you're having with those folks as they're thinking about making a move like this? Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the things um, that I think just going back to our experience with WeWork that I think has been very helpful for us is that, you know, I think one of the things, especially as a smaller company, you know, we don't have a lot of extra staff laying around who could manage a build out of new space, right? Or even once you're in space, you know, ongoing management of that space to make sure it's clean and safe and, you know, configured <coughs> properly as new people show up is actually fairly difficult and requires, a, you know, a reasonable number of, of staff. And so, you know, I think from, from our perspective, the ability to almost like outsource the, the you know, project management of getting a space built out onto the, you know, our, our sort of sub landlord in this case in the form of WeWork, that's actually very effective for us, right? Because, you know, our COO, you know, the people who are head of finance, the people who'd have to be really responsible and sort of get stuck for months managing an architect and managing a contractor to build out a space that ultimately, you know, will want WeWork like um, sort of space for our, uh, you know, employees. 
that's just a huge, huge burden for, for a company to take on. So I think that's also one of like the underlying trends that makes a WeWork or an Industrious or a Convene or really any of these providers very attractive to smaller tenants is that you know they have a lot of expertise around building out space that you know works for people, right? It's it's not that perfect, you know, Google branded space that they've spent so much time and effort curating, but it's probably eighty percent of that, right? Um, and the ability to just sort of like show up, it's there on day one, and you can just sort of plug into that uh, and have it be a pretty nice space that's pretty attractive to new employees, even if it doesn't wear your brand perfectly. Like that's just a really attractive sort of um, thing for us. And I think one of the things for landlords to consider is that. They similarly have all sorts of construction expertise, um, but they historically haven't sort of gone for that last mile of really building the space out for the tenant. So one of the things you also see commercial landlords doing is creating all sorts of pre-built spaces, right? Where if you're trying to do a lease, you can show up in the spaces 90% built, 90% configured to you know, the SL Green standard spec, right? And I think that's also a, a response to things like we work, you know, effectively Tenants, especially smaller ones, don't want to show up and just see like an open, demolished space and then be like, cool, I'll move in nine months later, you know, once I spend millions of dollars on, on construction. So I think, you know, just everything is moving towards more of this turnkey type format because managing construction is such a pain and, you know, the people who have the sort of capacity to do it are the folks who do it in high volume, like a, either a WeWork or an industrious or a traditional commercial landlord. You know, it's interesting. I was just going to say, and the snack pantry is never empty because the WeWork is responsible for that. There's yeah. always beer on top and there's always coffee. Um, I think like those are like the small little nuanced things that don't cost companies a lot of money. Um, and they're like little thrills that there's tons of startups are talking about how many snacks they have and the beers and the amenities they have. And that is a, totally a win for WeWork. Say printing though too. It's yeah. funny, right? Like, yeah. Wi-Fi. Yeah, to go buy your own printer and set it up and the network, and yeah. it's pretty funny. How often have you had beer? Actually, I'm curious. How do we work? Yeah. I, I don't. I'm not in a WeWork space. Oh, so I was. I finally one day, like four months in, they go have a beer, and they were out. The tap wasn't working. It was the one time I tried. I'm like, ah, <laughs> so many days I can drink in the middle of the week, you know? <laughs> the win of the year. Um, each of you has kind of talked about either significant growth in your own companies or working with companies that have really experienced significant growth in the tech space or somewhere else. How does a company manage that? And Scott, I'll point this to you. Um, as a company's growing, and how do they utilize that space and keep it flexible? Well, again, it's, that's the beauty of what was mentioned earlier is just the, the, it's all month to month, so the flexibility of it. There's always some level of vacancy in there. So if you suddenly need to go from whatever, like, like one person, two person, four person, bigger, like I've been in the honest building space, you have like a wing really right on your side. They've got the flexibility that you can move with it. In most major cities, they've got multiple locations. I think in Chicago, where I am, they've got maybe 10 buildings. The first one they took was the old Google space, actually. I think it was five floors uh, in River North. And so anyway, it's very much geared for that kind of environment. Um, we have actually have our office locations, only one that's permanent space, which is out of LA or something. Um, but I don't think, you know, it's not even about tech companies or other companies. It's not about millennials or not. The demand has always been there and was never really bad. Um, but the trick again comes on, you know, I worry about just in general, not even on this category, but relative to prop tech investment is everyone's always optimistic in the beginning. And you end up, you know, sadly with the majority, uh, of companies that end up being financially kind of imbalanced and it gets recapitalized or adjusted. So I worry about that with WeWork and there was a great article was in the journal or something, New York Times, six months ago, that was going through their economics and stuff that had leaked out and the sheer dollar amount of their lease commitments, which was in billions, and I don't think their revenue's broken a billion yet, actually. Let me try. Um, so you worry about the viability of them, but I don't worry about the viability of the idea because there's enough of the companies doing it and, and enough of the, the office uh, owners of space that are going to try to solve that in their own fashion. Hopefully not like the order you Expectations have definitely changed. Yeah, you really um, got to go. Yeah. You tell anyone, shoot a field trip after this, we'll go find Regis space and land. All right, that's homework for everybody. Go out and find some Regis space and see what we're talking about there. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. We'd love to get you guys involved too. Unfortunately, I don't have the same budget as Pat, so there's nothing under your chairs. Um, 
But if, are there any questions you guys have for this panel? A chance to really interact with some of the experts out here? Monday, or the third morning of the conference? <laughs> All right. Um, well, we'll transition a little bit then um, and talk about sustainability. Uh, Brian mentioned it a little bit in terms of some expectations around the way people look at the offices uh, that they're moving into. Um, is it a factor in determining if it's class A or not? Um, so Brian, why don't you expand a little bit on that and the sustainability aspect? Sure, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's certainly driven by tenant expectations, but also by um, investor expectations, right? So as you see the asset class become more institutionalized, you see more of the pension funds and the insurance providers pouring more money into this asset class. Those also come with higher expectations with their capital to be tied to more sustainable investments, right, just across the board. So you're seeing it not just driven by tenant demand, but also by investor demand. Um, you know, secondly, I think you're not also seeing that just driven by demand, but then also by financial performance. So you actually are seeing uh, buildings that have these lead certifications, the Energy Star certifications, actually driving higher rental rates, you know, actually driving um, you know, lower operating, um, operating costs, right? And, and I think as, as folks look for greater operating efficiencies in their portfolios, particularly in the core funds with these Class A offices, um, you're, you're going to see more of that. And as you, I'm going to, because I had a real job at one point, not doing consulting work, not that consulting is not real work, but I was at General Growth Properties for six years as part of the executive team, and then in a prior life before Blackstone took them out, I was part of the executive team at EOP. And, um, you know, the sustainability initially got branded as something, as a, as a label, but a lot of owners didn't understand it, right? I'm going pretty far back in time. And then pretty quickly people realize that there was no quantifiable value in the bottom line. So you take the energy category, just, this goes in line, I'm sure the comments you're gonna have, just because of lack of transparency and people not knowing, by knowing, you're seeing people drop their energy spend 12%, 14%, 17% of really pretty big categories, not just office, I'd say for you know the various you know asset classes. So you suddenly take that money and 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 Real estate, I'm gonna, this is getting recorded, so this is not gonna go well for me. Historically, it's we can cheap. Edit it out. Historically, it's cheap, right? It's a deal-oriented business historically, right? And so you'd say, okay, let's go do sustainability, and what's the economic lift? Well, now, you know, the economic lift is there, and then you put that in a cap rate, and you're talking giant numbers, really, right? And so the certifications and the various agencies have provided transparency and sort of um, uh, a way to measured, I guess, in some consistent basis and be awarded for it. But the reality is, is that there's real money left on the table that still a lot of companies aren't doing something with. So, interesting. Melissa, I know we talked yesterday about benchmarking and, and evaluating some of that. What are some of the things you're looking at um, as you try to put those metrics? Yeah, I would just kudos to both what you both said, um, that there's definitely money value behind sustainability, and I think it's finally there. There, I was at their Urban Land Institute fall meeting just last week, and um, there's people like Moody's Capital Markets are taking into account the sustainability, the risk associated with climate change into portfolios. So, um, and devaluing it, there's like a seven percent uh, devaluation of uh, properties, commercial properties in flood areas and in uh, sea level rise areas already. So it's a now thing. Maybe we'll loop this back to something I learned this week was public al housing also has this demand. Um, they have to report yearly their total utility usage to get operating budget from, from HUD, so the housing authority. Um, so even if it's not this kind of, I say it ne it's nebulous sustainability because it's this broad word, but really it's a matter of fact for them. Um, so how can you create efficiencies for public housing to report the utility data? Um, there's a lot of tech companies, Measurable's one of them, that's automating that collection of data and allowing them to measure manage and report, in this case, for public housing, their usage. Um, and then we've made technology that enables that um, to peer benchmark. So, hey, what is another San Francisco or in Atlanta? So an Atlanta hotel, how is it performing to a similar building? So that's <coughs> kind of that blind peer benchmarking. And then allowing owners um, or investors just to think strategically around um, this benchmarking. Um, like Scott said, being able to then see the returns uh, quickly. When we all spoke uh, on the phone a couple weeks ago as we were starting to talk about this session, um, Scott said get to the truth um, as part of this process. You know, I think we talked about 
This is a nebulous concept. But what are some of the truths that we need to look for when we're presenting to investors or presenting back to an, a housing authority? What are some of those aspects, Scott? Again, on the energy category, is always the low-paying fruit that there's there's almost always real money sitting on the table. And you know, the first stage is just trying to understand the various data points, and they use the term sort of base load. So if you imagine you turned everything off in your whatever building type it is, you turn everything off that you can turn off, and you look at that load, you look at that number, and and you'll find actually almost every asset class it depends. People are conniving to say. <laughs> People are jumping onto that that probably shouldn't, right? And and so then you start layering on the various aspects of what you do, and you now have got a metric of what it should be. And it's really simple things you'll catch, like the cleaning people leaving the lights on, which sounds like it's pretty, you know, not a big deal. It actually, is it all starts really kind of adding up. And um, so for me, you know, one is about the operating side and energy and utilities and you know water and there's all kinds of you know it's raining and you're not you've got sensors or somehow either you're um, have an IP address, whether your water system, your irrigation system, so you're solving that. But a lot of it is starting is about transparency. Now, what's funny is you think about, I'm like the oldest one in this panel, by the way, although it's obvious probably in some ways, but you go back in, uh, <laughs> yeah, you go, uh, you know, you go back in time actually, and um, there's a couple categories of it. So one is about the construction and the development side about sustainability, and Gresby and there's other groups that kind of rate that stuff. And then you go relative to the to the operating side, and you've got a range of these categories that I think have you know real value and, and uh, transparency. And where I was going is if you go back to the '70s and think about when you had a computer, nothing talked to anything really, right? And I'm not that technical, but you know these it's token ring or whatever. They'd all these protocols. Now you just plug in your desktop; it just works. Go back to WeWork or something else. That's what's happening with energy in some of these categories. They have protocols. It really comes down to a common protocol. They were battling for years, but that is that protocol that allows the various pieces of equipment energy for you to access them and communicate them. So a lot of times people think they've got to spend all this capital to solve the problem. You've got companies, some of which represent the era, that have easy ways to link in and gain transparency around what's happening with those things. And that's what's changed. Now, if you go in other categories like security, you, like access controls and doors and they hate each other, actually. They don't want to use anyone else. There's no common protocol. It's hard to work with. Uh, relates to tenant services. But on energy and utilities and those things, it's pretty cost effective on a capital to do it an operating basis to figure out you know, what you're doing to drop that number. So. I had a momentary flashback when you talked about the housekeepers leaving the lights on. I just could hear my mother. You're, you're uh, pulling the hole outdoors. You're heating the outdoors. Turn yeah. the lights off. Um, True. And those are great things to look at. Um, Jeff, what are some other things people should be thinking about as they are evaluating types of projects or even kicking off a program like this? Well, I think that you know the, the sort of idea there is that energy cost savings are extremely measurable, right? I mean, that's, yeah, of, <laughs> yeah exactly. I'm happy to pay me after. Softball. Okay. Um, but I think that you know it's therefore really easy for the sort of deal people in real estate that you described to be like, okay, I'm gonna invest a you know, dollar today and I'll get a dollar back next year. You know, that, that's, that's a really clear and measurable ROI. Um, and I think where you know, some of the like, newer sustainability things are around like well buildings and things like that. And so a lot of that is less related actually to energy usage. I mean, obviously there's something there, but a lot of that is like how the ocu occupants interact with the space, right? So you know, things like daylighting or you know, some of these sort of you know, more um, maybe new AG strategies, right? That are much harder to measure. But at the end of the day, you know, I think that's the type of stuff that's extremely important, you know, especially for office or you know, uh, hospitals or schools, right? You're not going there and paying money for that real estate except to you know, perform there, right? So you know, whether that's your, your office employees doing their work more effectively, you know, patients recovering more quickly at hospitals. All that kind of stuff is extremely important, but it's really, really hard to measure, right? You know, if you make an improvement to the way the lighting is in the hospital, does that mean people, you know, recover faster? Like, you know, super difficult to measure that. And so I think, you know, it's hard for those types of investments to, you know, for people to, to justify. Less know. new construction, you would think, right? More so, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it's obviously when you're starting with a blank canvas, yeah. you can do a lot of these things and you know configure the space to get all the benefit for for you know no real incremental cost. But yeah, so I mean, I think there's 
as we get smarter about measuring things uh, over time, you know, and, and everything, you can just plug in and interoperate as well. Maybe there's opportunities to start measuring some of you know, these more ephemeral benefits today. I think that's a great point, Brian. Maybe you could talk to this a little bit. We're, we've kind of covered some of the aspects of looking at an investment or someone looking to invest in a space. What about the people who are occupying the space, kind of building on what you Yeah, no, I think that actually um, what you see now is people focusing not just on the efficiency of the building, but the productivity of the tenants, right? And so, you know, workplace productivity is now becoming that new success metric, both for tenants and for landlords, and, and how can they improve that, not, not just from having, you know, better lights in the, in the space, but having better daylight, you know, having better air quality. Um, there are actually certifications out there now looking at that more holistically rather than just from an energy efficiency standpoint and more so from an occupant health standpoint um, and, and driving and trying to see the ties of, you know, what these improvements do to, you know, yourself as an employee working in the space. Do you feel, you know, positive? Do you feel more productive? Um, do you feel more energetic in different spaces versus not? So I do think that's a big part of, you know, as we start thinking about that tenant experience, kind of trying to drive that productivity and, and making folks feel, you know, happy. Productive. Does it become a way that companies compete for employees? If they put Melissa. Uh, yeah, I'm going to answer that question really quick. But I, something resonated with what you said, Brian, is you want people to feel productive. And I think hearing about like the whole theme of the MRI conference is like this inter interconnected, open, connected platform and turning tasks that once were manual into uh, like an efficient automated platform. So if you think about that at the building level, like things that were just mundane of going to your office and not being able to plug in, trying to get onto Wi-Fi, like now it's so easy, companies like WeWork make it so easy to make your work more efficient, kind of in a very similar fashion that MRI makes their software by being integrated and open, uh, more efficient. Uh, but they paid me to say that. That's <laughs> you tied it right in too, you did a job. Now your question was, so I was, yeah, around employees or people who are occupying the space. Does it become a competitive advantage for a company to take this path? Yeah, for sure. I think companies are branding themselves on what they offer their employees in the form of workspace. Um, it's definitely a competitive advantage. Uh, and what we use at our company to market to um, people that we're trying to recruit. I think another way, too, is we're looking for a new office space, and we've written into our lease requirement that the building needs to be Energy Star certified. Um, and uh, needs to have a lot of these health and wellness amenities. So now going out to Cure Space, we're not only just trying to write software that allows other companies to do it, but also really walk in the talk. Um, Jeff, who are some of the people in a company um, as they're evaluating taking on a project like this? You know, who are the stakeholders that need to get together and evaluate? Yeah, well, so one thing just to follow on Melissa's point, I mean, Definitely just from trying to grow a company. I mean like what we spend probably most of our time on is trying to recruit great talent um, You know, so if your office space is dimly lit or you know, there's a lot of ambient noise outside It's really hard to uh, you know, get people to you know, be like choose your company over the many other companies that are out there So that's a big deal um, In terms of the stakeholders. I mean, I think it sort of depends on what you know, what you're sort of Who you're describing right? I thought, I thought Brian's point earlier that investors are one of these really important stakeholders where you know if you're a local developer and all of a sudden a major pension fund comes in and says hey we want to support this project and be your JV partner but here's our list of requirements that list of requirements is going to be pretty long right and you know folks like calpers etc would have real um you know real hard requirements around sustainability around reporting requirements and things like that and so i think that at, you know, we've done a lot of work uh, internally at our company just looking at the rise of the institutional investor over time. And, you know, institutional money, you know, folks like Blackstone coming into the market has changed the way, you know, sort of real estate's always been this like local game. Uh, and there hasn't been as much, you know, there's been a lot of autonomy for the developer or the owner to really set things up the way they want. And now that it's becoming more, much more institutionalized, um, you know, and your, your, the money sources are becoming a little bit more concentrated. You know those those demands really change the way people people think about that stuff. So it's not just the tenants, you know, pushing the pushing the owner. It's also the investor, as, as you mentioned, and I think that creates a pretty you know, pretty perfect storm for for seeing real real change in the market which we've seen over the last ten or fifteen years. It's a big undertaking uh, to do this to get certified to go through a, a project plan. Scott, how do you how would you advise someone to look at a cost benefit analysis of kicking off 
a labor-intensive and expensive process to go down this path? Well, you have to pilot it. You have to try. I think it's the only way. So you got to you got to take some level of risk to decide you're going to spend capital on a pilot basis to evaluate and identify what those opportunities are. And there's enough data, going back to your points earlier, where pretty quickly, comparatively, you can kind of see where you stand at some level, and use that as a main, you know basis then to spend a little bit more capital than go all the way, or even comparative basis relative to your own assets or something. So I don't think, again, it's as complicated. I mean, it is complicated in some ways, but it's less complicated because there's so many companies out there now trying to help solve it and build the transparency and have the software and the products and the tools to um, make it easier for you to understand kind of what's going on. So that's really the only way of doing it. There's no you know, magic to it. You're seeing some because of the ratings alone, and, and you're right, decisions are going to be made both at an institutional investment level and on a, on a lease basis that now are driving more momentum. And you know, you would argue historically the A-level assets were the ones that always kind of were there anyway, or there earlier. And now, you know, the B guys are getting beat up for it, or the A guys that are, you know, like, okay, we gotta go get certified, or we need to get whatever done, because it's actually impacting deals. And that's changing behavior as well. Yeah, Brian, I think that's something you mentioned, that that's almost a price of admission now uh, for these spaces. Correct, yeah. I mean, you, you could certainly poke a lot of holes, I think, in both Energy Star and Lead certifications. I think they're far from perfect. Um, but, but certainly, I think folks look at it not for the actual environmental benefits alone. I think it's just more about having that sticker on, on your building, right? It's just branding. So, so like, especially in downtown San Francisco, where we're located, I mean, pretty much every building downtown like, has to have that. It, it's going to remain competitive on the market. Um, and I think to Scott's point, you know, uh, just piggybacking on the benchmarking piece, I think it is very, very critical. You, you understand what your peers are doing, certainly establishing that baseline to Melissa's earlier point and, and trying to figure out where you want to go. Um, comparing across you know, all of the, the categories of your financial statement and what your goals are from a financial standpoint. Yeah, and if I could add, another piece that's coming into play is the regulation around this. So cities are requiring buildings of certain size and asset type to report their yearly energy usage. Um, definitely in all the major cities in the U.S. and even some of the um, middle markets are making that a requirement now. Um, and then cities are coming, or states are coming online. So California as a state just passed a law um, a month ago saying that by 2030 the entire energy load is going to be 50% renewable. So what does that look like? How does it matter for a person that's managing one building? Well, now you're going to have that burden yearly to report your usage and do things at your site to be more energy efficient. So you don't see you know, outside vendors trying to bring in energy efficiency solutions to your uh, property. Um, and then I think you know, like city mayors are signing on. So there are about 1,000 mayors that have signed on to say, yeah, we're, we're joining this fight too. Um, so they can make these big, large statements like reduce your load by 50% or reduce to energy, uh, renewable energy by 50%. Uh, but where the action actually happens is at that site level or that fund manager level. Let's dig into that a little bit more. Um, you know, the cities are creating spaces where people can live, work, and play. Um, maybe expand on where you're going and talk about how those mayors are interacting with the property. Yeah. Um, so funny story. Last week I was in Boston and the the mayor um, stood up there and he had the thickest Boston accent. And I don't know about you, but when someone with a thick Boston accent that just talked about the Red Sox for like the first 10 minutes of the speech, then goes transition straight into climate change and sustainability and how he sees him building his future city that he has to have that in mind. Um, that made me kind of like open my eyes, like okay, this is a this is real deal. Um, and all these cities are putting out climate action plans, uh, making it really more real. To just point, it is that perfect storm, right? Because you have the money at the very top, those institutional uh, investors asking for it, all the way down to that property manager having to enter <coughs> energy data, water data, um, uh, waste data. Yeah. Can, you, can you build on that a little bit more, Jeff? Yeah, I figured after talking about the Red Sox for 10 minutes, they were, they were then going to transition to the Patriots or something. But uh, <laughs> I'm glad they uh, transitioned to you know talking about, about climate change. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that. It's just 
I think the regulatory piece is super important as well, right? And I think um, there's just so much risk associated with spending money on real estate, right? If you're a developer, probably the biggest thing you think about is all of the risk you're gonna have to take to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. There's so much entitlement, there's so much, you know, there's probably an 18 month or longer process just to get your property ready to, you know, to be built. So I think the, you know, the way the regulatory environment thinks about this stuff is huge. And I think one of the things that's really hard is, you know, institutional investors don't move super fast, but they definitely move way faster than cities do. Um, technology moves, you know, sort of at the speed of light, but the speed of regulation sort of always struggles to catch up. And so I think one of the things that ends up happening sometimes is that because for, I think for very rational reasons, regulation is there to protect people and you know, not allow too much risk to be taken, especially when you're building buildings, which I think is logical. But at the same time, it doesn't always necessarily have the right, doesn't necessarily create the right preconditions for developers or owners taking risk and, and trying on, you know, new, new, you know, new initiatives. You know, Scott mentioned, I think, that if you want to try something new, the best way to do it is pilot, right? You want to learn a little bit before you go all in. And I think that makes a ton of sense. But if the regulatory environment makes that difficult, then it can sort of slow the pace of learning and, and innovation. So I think, you know, mayors and, and you know, the, the other sort of folks that are key parts of the regulatory policy making machine, I think need to need to start to think a little bit about how you can allow for some of that pilot type innovation without, you know, <coughs> overhauling the entire system. It's hard to you think of the city level because if, if you can you can set policies or set metrics or require reporting. You can master a plan, but it takes decades. And, and what's interesting then is you take companies in our space that have aggregate control and scale. So Irvine company ranks, right? Just because in what they've done and continue to do in Newport Beach and Irvine, I think is really pretty interesting. You take Brookfield, you don't know, hear about Blackstone Place, you hear about Brookfield Place. It's interesting, right? And these larger scale live, work, play type communities, and then you see subsets in certain park of, you know, parts of the world. The, the only one I think that might be really interesting to look at is a test case that has been decades still, as you'd say, Dubai. And they're getting more and more aggressive on tech, and there's thing with cryptocurrency, they have the Dubai, I think it's Smart City Initiative, which is all about analytics. It's about city analytics, and the real estate owners there are, are um, being asked to contribute more than this energy utilization, a bunch of other items. But outside of that, it's it's hard, right? It just takes a long time in any individual city to sort of affect change that quickly, right? Because we just don't develop that many buildings. That, you know, you don't tear that many down and rebuild. So, yeah. And one thing I'll add is, you know, I think it's it's very interesting being a software company that you know helps real estate owners manage construction because you know we release new of our product every week, right? It's very easy to, software is very malleable, right? And you can write something and be like, oh, we kind of wrote it, you know, in not the exact way the user wants it, so let's rewrite it and, you know, push out an update next week. You definitely can't do that with a building, right? It's, it's like you gotta get it all right and you have to build it in one, one, you know, at one time. And if you wanna change it later, you know, there's huge dollars of capital that have to be spent to reconfigure space. So I think that's also one of the real challenges is that reconfiguring the physical environment, there's no agile process like there is with software. And it's interesting, the concept of moving back to the cities and these live work plays have kind of created their own challenges and problems for the infrastructure of the city. Um, Scott, I think you mentioned one time that 30% um, of urban congestion, I think that's right. Is it's trying to find a parking spot. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting, right? And people have been thinking about it. That's why there's so much emphasis going relative to what's happening within the parking space. And then more owners, because there's a lot of revenue in parking as well. And most people really are conveying the um, availability or utilization of those spots. I mean, it's come a long way. It depends on the cities. Like, Frisco's right, San Francisco and Seattle are good. Chicago's like hit and miss or something. But there's a lot of focus going on, I think, relative to that you know category. There was a company called, it was a funny one called Spot Monkey or something. And it was, it was genius though. It was piloted in Chicago when you're in core urban and, and parking the streets tough. What it was is you would get, hey, I've got this spot. I'm already parked. I'll give my spot up to you for X dollars. So the car pulls up, you pull out. It was a whole, it's fascinating, really, right? But yeah, 30% of, of congestion in cities is parking alone. And of course, as real estate owners of regard, whatever asset class, right? We are, we are offers of parking spaces and you know, users as well. So. It's actually interesting because in San Francisco now, the primary source of congestion isn't folks looking to find parking for their own cars. It's folks waiting for yeah. Ubers, yeah. Lyfts, you know, it's the Ubers and Lyfts coming in from 
all different areas outside the city. The drivers don't know how to get around. They're just stopping in the middle of the street. They're holding up buses, you know. So that's actually become a big problem. And the city recently released a report that was basically blaming these ride-sharing companies for that. People are swearing. <laughs> yeah. There's a great article. Deloitte put out an article about, because it aligns with autonomous vehicles, because it's still this thought that this congestion getting get better. And Deloitte, this goes back two years, and Deloitte argued it's actually going to get worse. And I kind of agreed, actually. And the reason why was I've got four kids and a dog. And you can put them all in separate cars and let them go everywhere, right? Where now I've got like two cars or three cars. Suddenly, I could utilize six cars, which is pretty exciting, by the way, six cars at a time. But you know, what does that do to congestion? We don't know, actually. It's really interesting, right? And you're seeing that in a different way, right, within the city in San Francisco. And we're seeing, uh, in fact, I'm actually kind of lucky to be here, so I tried to take a scooter over to the party on the Hans, um, thinking that would be a good idea. Um, How'd it go? I think I'm the wrong demographic. <laughs> not go well, but I made it, and I made it back in an Uber. Um, <laughs> but I think we're seeing this in a lot of different ways, too. Is, um, I didn't tell you guys about this, but you know, we see it in retail as well, as we think about the pressures that retailers are facing with e-commerce. And how are they address addressing that? Well, they're talking about reconfiguring their spaces to allow people to order online and come pick it up at the store. But what does that do to the traffic patterns in the, in the parking spaces or the way that the store is configured? Um, putting in grocery stores. I was on the other side of that. You, you know, take an anchor and put in a grocery store. Do you really want to go there in December at a mall to go shopping for groceries? It's, it's tough, right? Yeah. It's not an easy thing. I, I saw a street art when I was on my run yesterday of a, a, like a multifamily futuristic looking house, and there's little cartoons coming out of it. And it was like, well, Postmates deliver kombucha to me. Mm -hmm. And that just had me thinking, and Scott, you lit that light bulb. It was like, People just want things delivered to them. They want it fast. It goes with the scooter thing. I don't even want to wait for an Uber anymore. So I see the scooter, I'm going to jump on it. Um, I'm too lazy to walk down to the, the grocery store. Even if it's cold or even if it's a mild temperature, will they deliver kombucha like to my space? So um, it all gets back to the design, the community aspect of it that we started our conversation around is um, that instant gratification. Um, we don't want to look for a parking space anymore. Uh, I don't know how it's going to change. It's to flip this also to like the um, the future looking at garage spaces. I would love to hear your guys' input of what you think when we do go um, driverless cars. Uh, what what does a garage space look like? And maybe Jeff, like, are developers looking at it all? Like, going like, how do we position ourselves? Yeah, well, I'm just thinking about my future house with the six-car garage. Uh, to, to this point. But yeah, yeah. Goals, yeah, you thought you were going to get your garage back. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I mean, I think that all of those trends are sort of coming together, and then real estate developers are responding to that, right? So there's just all of this, you know, massive growth in industrial warehouse development. You know, and the, the, one of the large drivers of that is that people need to have distribution centers outside the city so that they can take all the, e, you know, e-commerce merchandise and then ship it into, into downtown. And at the same time, retail is sort of shrinking in general. Um, and, you know, however, that doesn't mean that retail is dead necessarily because there's, you know, branded experiences like soul cycle and things that are like growing like crazy. So I think that it just results in this massive reconfiguration where, you know, a lot of what retail is doing. And so Brookfield, you know, obviously just bought uh, GGP. Uh, and I think the idea there is, you know, but that's obviously a sort of nice contrarian bet in the sense that, you know, if retail is dying, why buy one of the biggest retail owners, you know, in the, in the U.S.? And I think their idea is that there's a lot of opportunity to reconfigure that, not just to be a mall the way it traditionally stood, but start to have it be this sort of live, work, play type environment where, you know, you can build a multifamily building on top of it. And, you know, it's kind of unclear what that does to, you know, parking utilization and things like that, you know, as, as people are coming to the mall during the day or leaving and then people come home from work at night. You know, so I think it's not really clear how all those factors kind of merge together and then what exactly that means, but definitely means like a lot of reconfiguration and, and you know, some massive changes to the way real estate has been done for the last 50 years. Green Street, I don't know if you know for Green Street, so they're more for the public guys, right, as a rating agency at Newport Beach. They did a report a year ago on parking and sort of what it meant economically. It had more of a, um, you know, retail bend. And then the other thing you mentioned, Jeff, too, is 
they're, they're, and you look at the industrial's hot, right, in general, which makes sense in the volume and the shift of behavior. Having said that, and you probably know these stats, but if you pick by individual <laughs> item level versus like boxes and giant pallets, the demand of the space is like fourfold, right? But you actually go to the large logistical, anyone on the industrial side in here or not? Okay, so, but it's interesting because you look at the, the amount of warehouse space or industrial space being used for individual item pickup, it's less than 10%, I think, actually. It's not, at least what I'm hearing, it's, it's not yet a significant, it's interesting, right? So it means there's still a bunch of more lift on the industrial side, but it, it's not the number that you would think it would be. It surprised me, right? And, and I've heard these stats kind of a couple of times. I think on the retail side, every generalization or some truth and not true. So the thought is, can the email guy is still going to live, right? And that's probably Brookfield's bed. And, and the C-level mall space is tough, and the Bs are a big question mark. And um, you know, we're 24 square feet per capita retail space in the US. I think the next biggest country is half that. So there's a belief that number is going to go down to about 18 square feet. The reality is I don't think anyone knows. I think they're guessing, but they know that we're over retail. We're actually starting to see um, industrial and warehouse properties moving into the cities. Mm -hmm. um, and multi-story uh, situations are evolving. And I think we're also starting to see the need for amenities in those spaces as well, that the people who are working in them have different expectations in their workspaces as well. And I can just see the, well, I guess it's gonna be drones by that time, but uh, the congestion can only increase as the delivery trucks need to come out into the cities. I'll pick up on that drone piece. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting. There's a company out there, and the name escapes me at the moment, but the drones, the airspace in between in a major city, like if you think of New York, that airspace that drones would fly in is actually not regulated. And so there's a company that's commercializing now um, and mapping the airspace. So when drones come to play, you can charge for a preferred space. So we're, we're talking congestion on the ground right now, but I mean, man, I guess maybe in the next 20 years we're going to talk about drone congestion in our airspaces around it and regulating around that. So uh, who knows what will happen, but that'll be a good conversation. The Hyatt re uh, regulates drone space here in the hotel, by the way. Uh, we're just going to try to film one of the general sessions with the drone, and that was uh, summarily dismissed by the hotel. Yeah. Well, and you can do geofencing, right? So uh, like big stadiums when there's concerts or the Padre Stadium I'm in San Diego, has a geofence. You literally can't fly a drone over it. Um, I think of that as a great technology that'll probably bring to scooters. So we're seeing scooters and line bikes trashing our cities. Um, I don't know what it actually will look like, but a geofence in like, uh, you know, walkways, or you can't put a scooter laying down in the lawn. Um, I don't know what blows up if you do that, but I don't know. Right? <laughs> you <laughs> blow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You go. <laughs> One beeped at me so hard the other day. I don't know what I did to it. Um, San Diego is a great place for scooters. Uh, it's always nice there. It's barely ever raining, so it's a great transportation for us. Um, and you really think about that last mile. Like I don't really have to care about parking. If I go to a concert, I can park far away. Know there's a scooter there. I have a scooter in. Um, but I was trying to park it, and I don't know what I did to it. But it would not stop beeping. I just ran away. So. <laughs> You're on a watch list somewhere. Oh my yeah. God, this thing's recorded. <laughs> That was Melissa talking there. Only female voice. Well, I mean, it's really interesting because there are companies out there now, like software companies, that are specializing in drone defense, right? It's like, okay, so you're a landlord, you have these drones just coming into your airspace, like, how do you prevent that? And especially if it's an invasion of privacy of your tenants, right? So, so now you're seeing a market for these software companies that are tracking, they're monitoring, they're helping you, you know, not just surveil your lobby against intruders, but also your airspace against intruders, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a real thing, <laughs> so. No, I just say even the exterior of the buildings for augmented reality, people are trying to give the legal rights of the, the visual representation of their asset, not getting used without their own control. It, it's crazy what a thought, right? So. so let's turn that around and talk about how those companies can attract people in. Talk about keeping them out a little bit. But let's take the mall setting, for example. Um, what are some ways that a landlord could support their tenants beyond just kind of the upgrades mm -hmm. or amenities? Um, Jeff, are there some things that they can do? Yeah, I mean, maybe host a, a drone race and something. Actually, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Fun, with beer. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> that we work. Yeah, down the halls. Yeah. Yeah. 
it all comes together, <laughs> convergence, right? Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the landlord and their tenants, um, you know, while maybe sometimes, especially during, you know, lease negotiation feeling adversarial, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a partnership, right? If, you're, if your tenants aren't successful, the landlord is not gonna be successful. Um, and obviously that's extremely true in retail just because of the way the leases are structured. So I think that, you know, for the for the landlord, you know, like you were mentioning, C, C class malls are, you know, on the way out. A, a malls are probably here to stay and B malls kind of unknown, right? Well, landlords have to be, I think, pretty thoughtful about working with their tenants to figure out what's gonna help drive traffic to that to that mall, you know? And, and it's probably more than just like upgrading the signage or like redoing the landscaping, right? They're, they probably are gonna be more meaningful reconfigurations that they're gonna have to consider. So, you know, I think it's just, really incumbent upon the, and I think this is the same as it's always been for real estate, right? I mean, like it's all about, you know, is, is your space driving value? Is it, is it using its highest and best use? Um, and so I think just as technology causes some of these changes in the way people use space to happen more frequently or at, at a higher clip, you know, I think it's just more incumbent than ever on the real estate owner to be really thoughtful about, you know, how their space is being used and what they should be doing to it to, you know, make it profitable over the next, you know, five, 10, 20 years. Take, for example, uh, the Pond City Market, what Jamestown has done to it. Um, it was a serious distribution center, then a city hall. Um, pretty homeless people were there for a while, and then Jamestown came in and really revitalized the center. They did a lot of creative things um, to offer you know, cool tenant space at so the rooftop, right? They're leasing out the rooftop and have a little carnival and have a putt putt. Um, that's unique. I don't think when it was Sears, they had putt putt on the roof. Um, and then there's a garden, so people are putting these gardens on top of the roof and leasing the, a garden space out. Like, um, so a retail doesn't mean that there's just like an Abercrombie and Finch in, uh, you know, at JC Penney's in it anymore. You can do creative things, and that's all in the scope of uh, retail and what tenants uh, want to create a space like and what. Uh, the consumer also, I think, is looking for. Yeah, I think going back to the topic of you know the public-private partnerships and, and really trying to integrate with the community with some of these newer developments. Um, one example is the Salesforce Transit Center in downtown San Francisco. I mean, that's been a big um, example, although right now it's closed because some of the steel beams have cracked, uh, which is a little bit of a bummer after a couple billions of dollars of investment. So, <laughs> uh, but that being said, you know, it, it, when it did open, I, I think there was a lot of excitement just because you know it, it was a really um, open space. For, for the public, it was a park, right, on top of this transit center, which is right next to, you know, uh, Boston Properties, you know, Trophy Asset, now Salesforce Tower, um, and so that's kind of revitalizing that neighborhood. So so in terms of you know, attracting folks, I think it does go to Melissa's point of integrating more with the community, um, certainly redeveloping, um, you know, different neighborhoods that historically didn't have that investment, and, and you're starting to see some returns on investment from that. I think you make an interesting point about transit affecting the way cities are growing or changing. Um, Boston, um, not under Mayor Walsh and his Red Sox fandom, but the Big Dig, for all its pluses and minuses, created a beautiful greenway right through the middle of the city and tore down an eight-lane highway that really separated the city from the seaport. And the seaport has exploded in Boston. Um, even in the city I grew up, Little Rochester, New York, they tore down the raised highway. There we got another yeah. one. Yeah. Um, the Interbelt, they tore apart. And they're in the process now of working with developers and working with uh, public and private uh, enterprises to figure out how to use that space again and take an old kind of crumbling city and inject some life into it. So I think that public-private partnership is an interesting topic. Scott, do you have more? Well, part of your original question was about you know, what services you provide, I think. And I think what's interesting is, um, it goes back to a point Brian you made earlier, how do you figure out productivity? So in retail, it's sales per square feet. You look at traffic numbers. You can debate the value of traffic numbers. But ignoring that, you get sales per square feet, and the retailers report it. So you can see if they're doing something that's having an impact to sort of reinforce whether it's a service or whatever need you, you know, may be providing. And industrially, you can say you look at it, you look at turns. I don't even really look at it, but you can kind of look at turns and some activity within there. In office, we don't know what it is. Is it a service? I mean, on the energy side, I mean, is that actual productivity basis of employees People are trying to figure that out. So if you take a company called um, Convenience, a good example, and their Elevate platform, not the only one, is you know they're looking at utilization of space, like am I in conference rooms or not? Which is helpful, but if you've already leased the space, I don't know what you do with that. You know, it's like okay, that's the conference room we don't use. And that, but anyway, ignoring that. But you know, the, the goal I think is how do you actually figure out that people are more productive or not? And that's a beyond my pay rate or something. But there's something real that's there. 
and going back to other comments you were making as well, Melissa, about amenities and the we work and all that, and we're happier about it. And in theory, if you're happier, are you more productive? I don't know. Is it, I, I don't know, right? Like, that's got to get figured out. And there's a lot of smart people looking at that. And I think that that will ultimately change behaviors on the office side, the configuration of the space, whether it's lighting or the other aspects, and also services. But until it gets figured out, we're kind of shooting in the dark a little bit, right? Unless whatever service is being provided, you can see economically kind of off that if you're getting a lift or not off it, right? Like if I integrate better with valet services or reserve parking or seamless integration in my garage, the garage utilization go up, or gosh, you can order food off my app, or you could, you know, have concierge services. Those have transactional kind of value that you can evaluate. But these other areas, I think there is value, but we don't know how to quantify it. That's the hard part. Yeah, I think one of the proxy metrics that are being used now are the number of sick days that are taken across an employee base or the percentage of sick days that employees take. And I think that's one side benefit of a lot of these landlords investing in fitness services and their buildings, right? And, and the tenants really being behind that is because a healthier workforce means you know less sick days for that workforce. So they're actually in the office more often and actually collaborating more often with each other um, rather than being out of the office sick. And, and, and that's not just from, you know, personal health just for working out, but it's also, you know, providing healthier food options to your employees, right? Um, when you cater for food and all this stuff. So I, I do think that personal health element is that first inroad to quantifying that, that productivity, but to Scott's point, I mean, we're such a far ways away from actually figuring out what all the variables are in that equation. Like I bring my dog to work, it makes me really happy. But I don't know how you measure that. I bring my work, you know, around in Chicago, my dog's coming to work, but I don't know, right? It's funny. So. My dog would definitely be happy if I could do that. Um, we haven't figured out a way to pull that off yet. Yeah. We work. <laughs> Industrial, so you can bring your dog. It's all good. We've, we've covered a lot of ground this morning. And again, um, you guys have the experts in front of you right now. Are there some things you're thinking about that you want to ask these guys to respond to, react to? Things you're seeing in your own organizations and companies? There's an MRI t-shirt in it for you if you ask a question. Yeah, I, I I'm not that well educated on geofencing. I just know it as a way of keeping drones out of ballparks. Um, but, and I don't know about the technology, but I'm sure. What In what aspect are you thinking of like retail and geofencing? Um, so what we're, what we're looking at now is um, ways to gather potential demographic data, um, or analysis, where the shoppers are going, where the shoppers are coming from, where they're going in our centers. But then also uh, there's geofencing or um, being able to provide metrics on where within a space shoppers are going. Right. That was my part of life a little bit. I mean, the hard part with, you know, if you go off a Wi Fi, they'll tell you you can get like three, five feet in radius or 10 meters at best. And beacons, you need such a high concentration to make it meaningful, plus you need the app to do that. You can find there are um, three, going back to mapping in garages, a whole funky area too. There are three companies that are mapping companies that they aggregate geolocation GPS data. Um, TomTom, Tom, which used to have the old retail devices, right, for navigation and maps is one of them. There's one called um, Inrex, which quietly actually does all the algorithms for Waze and Google and those other guys. Um, and then the other one is here, which was formerly Navtech. that came out of Nokia, right, in Chicago. So those three at different levels are in the open market. You could approach them. I could give you contact information. And they can, based upon geo coordinates, can give you data. And there's some of that data is more meaningful than others, right? And going back, as part of the one is origin versus not just source. Um, so that gives you kind of more macro level. You can buy that stuff within the asset itself. You know, Wi-Fi data I still think is the because it's an amenity and people are doing it and you can sell it and do all kinds of funky things is probably the best one. But you can't get it tight enough for the concentration effectively to understand. Not you're never going to get aisle level movement in the cameras. You could get store level movement and dwell times, repeat visits, and stuff like that. Companies called um, other ones that aggregate Wi Fi data that will give it back to you as an owner. Euclid does that, which got bought out by Comcast, I think, last year. Um, Retail Next, uh, Shopper Track, kind of after 
a bunch of lawsuits with Shopper Track because people were pissed off at them. Uh, but they're still around. So anyway, I can, I, I can share afterwards in more detail. And there's some other data sources, like going back to the, every store has to file a tax return. Because they got sales tax rules, right, depending on the county. There's actually a company that's aggregating that sales information. And they have to report on their, like, sick code level, but it's pretty defined even in apparel. There's all kinds of funky things kind of going on that people are looking at to, <coughs> to figure out behavior. Um, sell data, Uber Media, not tied to Uber cars. They sell pretty finite, interesting data with demographics on and on movement as well. There's a, there's a bunch of them. So. Anyway. There's a company that's, uh, sorry, there's a company, I don't know the name, but it's taking the satellite images over major retailers, mm -hmm. so looking at like the parking lots of Best Buy versus Walmart on the weekend, and then selling that over to fund, uh, hedge funds who are right. then using that to, in their investments. Yeah, even the analysts are beating up the reads with it sometimes. Yeah, yeah it's brutal actually. So, yeah. Anyway. yeah, I mean, I imagine like Bird, the scooter company, could start selling that same travel data, right? Where are the people going? Um, there's a lot of data play um, out there. Yeah. But cars, and some like almost half of cars now are emitting a signal. And here's what's interesting, and they emit their own signal. So you've got companies looking to do power stations for Teslas. You can actually, with Wi-Fi devices, you can recognize the signals and how many Teslas are in your in your property. At one time, I'm like, it's getting crazy actually. Just turn it off. <laughs> turn it off. One, one, one just quick thing to add to that is, you know, so we run a, a you know, work at a software company, and, and you know, effectively we can measure and track every single click that's happening in our software product, and we use that to make better decisions about where to, you know, potentially sunset features or build new features or figure out where people are struggling. And I think that that's again one of the huge advantages of the digital world is that we can use that data in real time and then you know, the next week reconfigure the way the, the software works to better fit what people want. And I think, again, as real estate, given that it's such a physical asset and there's effectively no data on how people are using the space, you know, I think there's really interesting opportunities for real estate owners if they can get their hands on that, on that kind of data. So you know, just, just as you think forward to what it would mean, like, what would it, would it mean to manage a space you know, if you had full insight into how people were using it? You know, and that goes back to your point about convene. I think it'd be really great if, if you're in a convenience space and they say, hey, you're not using this conference room, think about reconfiguring it. That's such value add that you know a CEO or an office manager just would never have insight into unless you know they get that data and that insight from somewhere else. You guys got a question back here? So lots of conversation about the data. As an owner, uh, you hear a lot more about owners hiring data scientists and doing all this stuff. But is there any, you know, I'd be curious if the, the panel's discussion around you know should owners be investing in data scientists how are you which which sources of data should you trust are there are there market leaders out there that you should be looking at because there is data, there's data on your building there's demographic data there's retail data there's data 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 it's everywhere so is it a fool's errand to try to aggregate the data and do it yourself or are there leaders in the space that we should be looking at from you know a real estate owner's perspective on data well, one, one just thing I'll say is that I, I think from just from an <laughs> empathetic perspective, I think it must be really difficult for real estate owners to, to manage all this stuff, right? Because, you know, for 50 years, it's not been about how to use technology or data to make your asset better. It's just been about, you know, feeling the dirt or smelling the dirt and, you know, making sort of gut level decisions. And, and that I think has worked really well for, for a lot of folks in the industry. So I think it's really hard then to change the way you operate and become much more tech centric you know, why we have to invest so much in software or technology or data. Oh, by the way, you have to make all these disparate systems talk to each other, which is actually really challenging. So, you know, there's sort of, you know, we were at, at Realcom conference earlier this year and the sort of rise of the CIO within real estate companies is a big, big trend, right? And so investing in people who can help you make sense of this, I think is really important. But, you know, even, even huge real estate companies like equity office properties probably only have like you know, 500 people on, on staff, you know, because they're very lean shops relative to, you know, this stuff. So I don't think you're ever going to be able to have like a 50 person, you know, team there, you know, pulling in all these data sources. So I think what's going to have to happen, and this was similar to what I was describing about us being at WeWork, is the ability to like essentially push that on to a third party who can provide that to you as a service, right? Oh, you're a real estate company, here's the, the sort of data connectors as a service, these types of things in order to help you know, the people who are really smart about real estate but maybe not as smart about data or data science get access to those types of insights. So I, I don't really know how that's going to work. Um, but, I, it, you know, it, it's, it's a tough challenge when you don't have, you know, huge companies from a, 
a, a tech-based perspective, um, you know, trying to compete for talent on data science. You know, I, I just don't know how all that's going to play out. And they're they're hard to find and expensive or something. I think the answer to your question is you take every vertical there are providers. So if you said you wanted GPS data or Wi-Fi data or aggregators of energy data or whatever the category is, they're there. There's no one kind of going cross category, but the reverse is this is not like a build it and they'll come. So you, I don't you know, everyone's in different roles, different places. You can have great data and great insights, but maybe you know people in the organization aren't ready to consume it. And so the best way goes back to the other thing on you know sort of you, you, you pilot certain things, but look for the demand and, and do it. But you're never going to find a data scientist that is going to be any good in the scheme of things. It, 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 and, and you're better kind of finding sort of certain verticals or cross correlations. Like a great one example in malls and office buildings is using Wi-Fi data real time to offset HVAC loads. I know as a fact you will drop your energy costs. And when you go in a mall, it's freezing when you go in, right? Like. There's no reason for that. There's a lot of formats in real estate where that's true. And that's taking two data sets that no one today is really aggregating together. And so you just sort of have to keep it simple and, and do it yourself. But each vertical has got companies in it. So it just depends what you're out for. Yeah, I think this is part of the build versus buy you know, discussion in terms of technology in general. You know, do you want to go and build your own technology stack in-house or do you want to outsource with partners like an MRI? Uh, right to, to kind of help you with that. I know a lot of our clients are certain, certainly struggling with, okay, so we built this data warehouse, now what do we do with it? Okay, let's put on the front end, let's do some tableau, let's have some business analysts kind of go in and try to mine that data. But but it's it's very hard still to take action on that. So I think, you know, to your point, do we hire even more data savvy people in-house to try to do that? Or, or can we just outsource partners that can help us make sense of that data more effectively? I think it's a mixture of both. Um, you know, plugging Waypoint uh, shamelessly, you know, we're we're actually connecting to all of our clients' accounting software, so we're able to provide our clients with anonymous, aggregated market data directly from accounting systems, not from brokers in the market, not from phone calls they're making from owner to owner, but rather from a single source of truth, which is that accounting system, the data that you're putting into MRI, that gets aggregated and anonymized for all of our clients to take advantage of from a market comparison perspective. So I think to the extent you can find these third parties um, that are a little bit more objective um, and, and certainly maybe don't have any bias in that market specifically, but are just trying to provide that kind of uh, extra kind of data point to help you gut check some of your assumptions as an asset manager or as a property manager, then you know, I think that, that type of partnership is what you should be looking for moving forward if you try to make sense of that information. Yeah, and I'll guess I'll say I agree with what they're all saying. I think it's the common theme, let commercial real estate owners do what they do best. Um, and then partner with data partners like MRI of the world to figure out your data strategy. Um, I'll give you a little story. It's like, uh, I think last year, the VC money that went into prop tech was about $12 billion. And so you, you can see that as more or less the R&D budget. So rather being an owner and investing into buying, you know, hiring a data scientist, see this $12 billion of pool of venture capital money as basically free R&D money for you to go try out um, whatever vertical you're looking at. Um, in that creative R&D space. That is a great question, thank you. Uh, anybody else? I had my Phil Donahue, or I guess my, that was a kind of a dated reference. Um, There's no surprise guests <laughs> out there. <laughs> I'm worried, no. <laughs> no long lost relatives or anything like that. <laughs> anybody else? Well, I'll give you guys each um, a minute to close. So Jeff, why not start? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks again for, for having us. You know, it's been a great partnership with MRI, and we're really happy to be here. Um, you know, I think just the main thing I would say is, like, we talked about a lot of different things, like drones and driverless cars and, you know, uh, mega trends of sort of retail to industrial. Um, and I think probably the, you know, rather than get, spending too much time on any, like, particular trend, it's probably best to just sort of, like, be open-minded and understand that, you know, as technology changes, that'll cause the way people use real estate to change. And, and rather than focusing in on like one specific trend, just being open to learning about new things and, and keeping just sort of the broad trends in, in mind because we don't know, you know, what or how everything's gonna shake out. So I think that's sort of the takeaway is like don't get you know, don't get caught up in, in one particular thing like drones or Bitcoin or something. <laughs> Yeah, so first, thank you guys all for coming. Um, I know it's the last day of the conference, so I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. It's been an honor and grateful to be up here with these three great guys, with uh, representing three great companies. Um, yeah, my, my kudos thing is, Pat said it at the very beginning, at the opening session, 
truly an open, connected platform for all and bring that into how the work is done, how a workplace is uh, structured, how a software, how you grab data. So really just going off of that theme, going into your week with, and your month and the rest of the year, truly open and connected for all. Yeah, and I think just you know really take advantage, I'm sure you've heard it all week, but take advantage of MRI's Partner Connect program. I think you know they do a certainly a great job of providing you guys as, as their client base with a lot of different options out there to <coughs> experiment and try some of these interesting ideas. Um, our partnership specifically with MRI allows all MRI clients to take advantage of a free market report for their portfolio um, with Waypoints data. So, you know, that's just one example. I'm sure, you know, Honest Buildings and other partners of MRI have their own kind of unique offerings specifically for MRI clients that you should look at to help take advantage of um, some of these trends in the market and try to just you know, take the leap, so to speak, without too much risk at the same time. I don't have much more to add, so I just appreciate the time and being on the panel with everybody up here, and it was great. Thank you. Well, guys, thank you very much. Jeff, Brian, Scott, Melissa, great insight, great information. Uh, guys are uh, two sessions away from the close of IUC, but we really appreciate all of you coming as well. Um, and if you have some follow-up questions, you'll be able to find a lot of these guys in the Expo Center, the ecosystem, um, and thanks for coming to our session today. Thank you.